Psalm 47, Psalm 47. The word of God says, O oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abram. For the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. We ask God to bless his word to us. The title of the message tonight is The Power of Authentic Praise and Worship. The Power of Authentic Praise and Worship. Mary Peckham, uh, who was saved during the, the Lewis revival in 19, 1949 to 1952-53, she once said that authentic worship is love on its knees, offering its life to the beloved. Worship is love on its knees, offering itself to the beloved, to Almighty God. She also emphasized the importance of authentic worship by stating that worship is not preparation for the battle. Worship is the battle. That is, authentic worship, authentic praise isn't just a passive activity it's not something that we that we just do but it's an active engagement in spiritual warfare so when we've been praising god tonight we've been involved in spiritual warfare we've been declaring over all things that god is great that god is worthy when we worship and praise god it's love on its knees, giving itself to God, but it's also fighting the spiritual battle. You see, that lifts worship, that lifts praise to a different level. We don't come to church to sing hymns. We come to church to be involved in the battle against the enemy. We aren't here tonight or at any time as spectators. We are, and we know this, we aren't here to receive information about the battle. But when the church gets together and when Andrean starts us in praise and worship and leads us into that place, when Emma does likewise, what's happening is we are being led into battle. Isn't that amazing? And the enemy hears us singing about the greatness of Jesus. The enemy hears us putting our trust in Jesus. These are great reasons to praise God. We love him so much, we must. We can't do anything other. We give our lives to him. We surrender in worship. Oh, I, 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 I long for the day when, when we all are able to just surrender and worship, explode in praise. That the enemy would hear us with full hearts, overflowing hearts, declaring the greatness of our God. The power 
of authentic praise and worship. We're telling the enemy through the songs we sing, we love him and we do battle in his name. We hear so often of the church as a family, but we mustn't lose fact, uh, sight of the fact that the church is an army. And this is, a, this is a fight that we're in. We're, in war. we're at war. The difference between our warfare and, and warfare in general is that we know that our warfare already has its outcome. That our warfare already has its results. And that the outcome of our warfare is that Jesus Christ remains king. The outcome of our warfare is that our almighty God, as it says at the end of that psalm, he is greatly exalted. That will never change. The outcome will be God is exalted. And we're telling the enemy this as we buckle up fall to our knees, at least in our hearts, and, and declare how much we love Jesus. At the same time, we're telling the enemy, and you can do nothing about it. We are at war, and every single one of us in here tonight has the bruises, has the wounds, the scars, to prove that we're at war. That the enemy's come and he has he's struck us. And just because we know that the outcome of the war is positive for us doesn't mean that we don't feel the pain when the enemy comes and strikes us. But oh, that we would have the, the wherewithal and the, and, the, and the awareness at that moment to be able to fall to our knees. Not even so much to fall to our knees and ask, Lord, please help me. Yeah. I'm speaking to myself tonight. You better believe it. But that we would fall to our knees in the midst of whatever it is that the enemy's inflicting during this warfare, and we would be able to say, Lord Jesus, Whatever is raging, I love you. I give my life to you. I do battle in your name. I tell him, the enemy, how much I adore you. And I praise your holy name in mighty spiritual battle. Wouldn't that be great if we could do that? Wouldn't it be wonderful to see a church to be the kind of believer that is able to just bow before God in authentic worship, loving its knees, doing battle with the enemy. I mean, these are great reasons to praise God. We're here tonight to praise God. Before we ask God for anything, isn't it true that we adore him? Isn't it true that we praise him? Isn't it true that we should tell him how, how wonderful and beautiful he is in our lives? Acknowledging God. But there's, a, there's another reason for us to do that. Authentic praise and worship expresses the divine desire to be praised and worshipped. Almighty God wants to be worshipped. He wants to be praised. In our psalm it says, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. In verse 6 it says, sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our King. Sing praises. Now we know that's the psalmist. We know the psalmist is writing this, and this is his heart. The psalmist's heart is to clap hands and praise God, to lift up the name of his king. 
That's the psalmist's desire. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. But you remember that the psalmist is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this isn't just the psalmist's heart. This is the heart of the Spirit. This is the heart of the Holy Ghost. This is the heart of God. God is telling us, praise me. Worship me. Lift up my name and glorify me. God is saying, even in the midst of what you face, praise me. That's a hard thing to do at times. But praise me, let me know how glorious I am. I want you to tell me. Because I know how glorious I am. God's heart is to be worshipped. God's heart is to be praised. Four times in, in verse 6, the psalmist says, Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our King, sing praises. That's how important it is. He knows that there's power in praise. He knows that there is something precious when the people of God praise and worship our God. The deep desire of the psalmist, the deep desire of every believer, because it's the deep desire of Almighty God. He knows his value. There's never a day that God isn't aware of how precious he is. That doesn't make him some kind of Someone, I think I've maybe said before, someone said, that makes God sound like an old granny wanting to be built up and praised. Sorry for the old grannies in here. An old grandfather to be built up and praised. Someone who's so low in self-esteem that he needs you to tell him how good he is to build him up and keep him strong. God doesn't need this. He wants it. He commands that we praise his holy name. You're sitting there and you're in your own situation, says God. You are in your situation. Whatever it is that you're facing right now, I know what you're facing right now. So what you should be doing, the first thing you should do, says God, is tell me how good I am. Tell me how great I am. And when you tell me how great I am in the midst of your difficulty, then you begin to see how great I am in the midst of your difficulty. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God. Sing praises, sing praises unto our God. So we love him. We adore our God. We thank him for Jesus Christ. Our hearts are taken up with Jesus Christ and we want to praise him. We've been praising him. But oh, let's continue to praise him tonight. Let's continue to pray in the context of praising our God. Every prayer we bring to God tonight is couched in how much we love him, is couched in how great we see him, is couched in his majesty. We would see the greatness of God unleashed in our lives. We see the greatness because we are the redeemed and the redeemed of the Lord are meant to say so. We are meant to say that we are the redeemed of the Lord. He redeemed us. We didn't redeem ourselves. We didn't earn anything. He redeemed us. Oh, praise the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. That's what we want, isn't it? We want to be just letting go. Do you long for the day where we get together in, in either one of the prayer meetings or on a, on a, a, a Lord's Day? Do you long for the day where we just let go and sing our great Redeemer's praise? And it sounds as if there are a thousand tongues singing to Jesus Christ. 
Oh, how good would it be if that's what happens tonight as we continue to praise God or on Friday or on Sunday. Oh, Lord, just set us free to tell the world that we love you, that we adore you, that you are great. Not to tell the world what we're going through, but to tell the world how we're getting through by the power and under the hand of our majestic King. He's taking us through. May we be able to sing like that so that the enemy sees it. The enemy has inflicted us, but he hears us singing. He sees us fall to our knees. I've been trying to break you and you fall to your knees. And all I can hear is you saying how much you love Jesus. Oh, may that be the case. There's power in the praise of God's people. You see, it's so important. God wants us to praise him because he's worthy to be praised. But when we praise Almighty God, the power comes into our situation because the Bible tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people. So when we are in the midst of something and we are able to praise God, it's as if we're bringing, I'm using human language, as if we're bringing God into that situation in a powerful way because he inhabits our worship. Isn't that powerful? Authentic praise and worship takes place because it's what God desires. Let the redeemed of the Lord sing, sing. But not only does God command it or desire it, it's why he saved us. You see, the first five verses Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. All the time. Do you struggle to do that? Do you, do you struggle to do that? To sing in triumph? If you're anything like me, you will. But we've been told to, to, to cry out with the voice of triumph, for the Lord Most High is terrible or awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. You see, verse 6 says that he's our king. And he is our king. But in these verses, we're told in verse 2 that he is the king over all the earth. God wants all the earth to be praising him. He wants all human beings to praise his name. And the day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But until then, God wants all of us to be praising him because he's worthy of every ounce of worship from every human heart. But we don't see that, do we? We don't see every human heart praising his name. We don't see every human being giving worship to God, even although they should. They don't. So what does he do? He draws out the elect from the masses and he enables us to praise him. He wants praise from every human being, not every human being will praise him. And so what God does is he brings his own out from that great number and he gathers together this choir 
of people who will sing his praises and there will be so many of them that we won't be able to count them when we get home to glory. You've heard that the remnant is a very small remnant. It's only a very small remnant on earth. It's a number we cannot count when we get home to glory. That's how big the remnant is. It's going to be so big we'll never get to the end of it. And they'll all be singing the praises of God. Do you see how God will get the praise of humanity? God will make sure that human beings praise him because he will save human beings for that very purpose. That's what 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 tells us. To declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. How amazing that you and I tonight, we have been chosen and put in as part of this great choir. We have been made choir members tonight to sing the praises of God. And my goodness me, if God has gone to the lengths of the cross in order to save people for him to be praised through those people, then those people that have been touched by the blood of Jesus Christ had better praise the name of Almighty God. We should be praising God with freedom, with open hearts and full hearts pouring out. That's why we are here. You see, you've also heard it said, perhaps, that the church exists for the world. The church exists to draw them in. No, it doesn't. The church exists for mission. The church exists for evangelism. No, it doesn't. That the church exists for the hurting and for the, 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 the broken. No, it doesn't. The church exists to praise and worship Almighty God. We are here to glorify him. And then, as worshippers and God lovers and God glorifiers, our evangelism takes on a different power. Then the church welcomes in those who are hurt and broken and can deal with them. Then the church looks to see what it can do to help people in their lives, to help people come to Christ. But you see, the priority is worship. Worship. Worship flavors everything else. Intimacy with Christ flavors all we do, empowers all we do. So that when people encounter us, they realize, actually, I've encountered more than her, more than him. I've encountered Christ. There's something about these people that when I meet with them, when I deal with them, that there's something about them that is massively different. Jesus, that's what it is. When we're close with Christ, the world sees that we've been with Jesus. When we worship Jesus, he fills us with the power to serve him. He gives us that energy. He gives us that vitality. If we want to see people coming to Christ, then the first thing we must do is praise and worship Christ. I mean, we have to go with singing unto Zion. Not, we'll start singing when we get to Zion. As we're marching to Zion, we sing the praises of God. And when we do that, when we get to Zion, what are we told when we sing the praises of God? Everlasting joy everlasting joy will be upon our heads. But you see, as we go singing, we can experience that joy. You know as well as I do that when we, when Isaiah 51, 11 talks in these terms, but you know that, that when, 
as we go and as we worship, you know that that joy is poured back. You can witness to that. You can witness to praising God and then suddenly feeling. Or you come into church and, you, and, you, and you're down and, and it's been a hard week and it's only Monday. But you come into church and your heart is heavy and you start to praise God amongst the people of God and suddenly, before you know it, you're lifted from there up to here and you're singing with all of your heart and you're feeling the presence of Jesus Christ and it's lifted you up, strengthened you because you've been exalting him. The great thing about it is when we worship God, and I know I'm preaching to the converted, literally. When we worship God, when we praise God, he doesn't allow that to just rest with him. He takes it and turns it around and pours the blessing back on his people. So we praise God. God saves us to praise him. But there's one thing to close with very briefly. The end of, sorry, the second part of verse 7. It says, for God is the king of all the earth. Then it says, sing ye praises with understanding. That is such an important thing. Authentic worship, authentic praise is praise with understanding. Veneer isn't enough. The psalmist wants more than superficial. So does God. It's not about gold plating. It's about solid gold. It's not about paste. It's about diamonds. God wants diamonds. God wants solid gold in the worship that he receives. Jesus quoted Isaiah in Matthew 15, 8. He says, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That isn't authentic praise. That isn't authentic worship. Authentic worship comes from the heart. Authentic worship comes from the heart. That's why it is so precious at times when we sing some of the old songs. Because these songs came from experience of Jesus Christ. They were written out of a powerful experience of Christ. But whether they're old songs or whether they're new songs, oh, may they always be songs from the heart. Songs that know Jesus Christ. Songs that are coming from people who, who've experienced Jesus Christ, who have been touched by Jesus Christ. That's the kind of worship we want. Because, you see, when we sing those songs, we're not just singing in inverted commas, truth, brilliant though that is but we're singing truth on fire. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that's what preaching is. It's truth on fire. That's what worship is. That's what praise is. It's, it's truth on fire. It's a, a worship leader who has been experiencing God in the week, who's been dealing with God in the week, who's been seeking God in the week and has been given something for the congregation. And when we join in those songs, we feel it. It's like, it's like the preacher. He's, he's before God in the week to get a message for the people so that when he preaches it, it's not him preaching it. It's God speaking through the man. That's, that's what true worship is, true praise. It's us reflecting what what God has been doing with us. Oh, how precious it is. But it's got to be understanding. 
It's got to be a not simply understanding doctrine. It's about understanding Jesus. It's about understanding the relationship that you have with Christ. It's about this relationship growing and developing as you're in the Word and, and it's deepening and, and it begins to erupt in you. I'm not talking about Andrine or Emma now. I'm talking about all of us. It begins to erupt. It begins to come to the surface and I'm praising God because of this beautiful relationship I've had with God this week. That's why Peter says we have to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the more we grow, the more we show. The more he deals with us personally, the more we reveal publicly. So the psalmist reflects God's heart, and God's heart is sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our King, sing praises. Just as we come to prayer, um, Wilhelmina has asked us if we can remember our mum. I think she's suffering from ulcers in her legs, which are giving her a lot of difficulty and causing her a lot of pain and a lot of fear. So we can, we can remember Wilhelmina's mum uh, before God and all the other folks that we pray for every, every week. Let's come before God then um, and let, let's pray and then we can get together. Dear Father, we, we thank you so much for our Lord Jesus Christ. We come before you tonight with our hearts filled with a desire to praise the great name of God. We bring our requests, we bring our concerns before you, but we bring those concerns before you as we sing the greatness of Jesus. We come before you, Father God, with the, with the worries of our lives and we lay them down because we know that Jesus Christ is wonderful. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is glorious and majestic and victorious. We come before you confidently, Father, and we lay before you Wilhelmina's mother and, and, and we ask, oh, Father, that your hand would touch and heal. Touch her and heal her, Father. We come before you knowing that you are a God who is able to do these things. We come before you, Father, and we believe that you're willing to heal. And so, Father, we commit that woman to you. We commit our brothers and sisters to you tonight. We commit this fellowship to you tonight, Father. And we are so grateful that the one to whom we come is our King. He is the King of all the nations. We are so grateful tonight that the one to whom we come is worthy of all our praise and all our adoration. And so receive our requests, we pray, Father. Wrapped up in the love that we have for you as we fall to our knees and surrender to the Beloved. And we ask it in all, all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.